Raul Jaime Orzabuzela Quintana was born August 22nd, 1961. He got the name Raul from his father, George Orzabuzela Quintana. The name had been in the family for generations. George was a Frenchman, though his father was Argentine. Two weeks after Raul's birth, his mother, Margaret Orzabal de la Quintana, renamed him Roland since it was an easier name for English speakers to pronounce. George and Margaret owned an entertainment business and their home was always filled with country western singers. George was quite musical and was once part of a mandolin orchestra, and yes, apparently mandolin orchestras are a thing which exist. The family lived in Havant, a town in the southeast corner of Hampshire, England. So Roland grew up in a creative home, though he always had a strained relationship with his father. When he was seven years old, his parents split up. One morning when George was asleep, Margaret left quietly, taking her children with her. Hence, Roland ended up in a much more regimented household with his cousins and aunt, where afternoon tea was strictly at four and mornings were routine. He had lost the fluidity and French culture of his old home and struggled with this change. It's really funny because it was a big shock to me because I was so used to how we did things at home and all of a sudden there was this rigidity and at three o'clock or four o'clock there was afternoon tea and in the morning you got up you did this and did that blah 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 It was during his teenage years attending Culver Hay School in Bath that Orzabal met Kurt Smith They became close friends the turn of events came when Orzabal read The Primal Scream written by notable psychologist Arthur Janoff Janoff was quite influential at the time, and his works and theories had served as inspiration for John Lennon and other musical artists. The Primal Scream delved into neuroses rooted in childhood experiences and the suppression of feelings. Orzabal connected with these ideas since he had a problem childhood. Kurt Smith also had parents who separated when he was young, and Orzabal encouraged him to read The Primal Scream. While Orzabal's family thought his obsession with the book was strange, Smith understood. During their college years, Orzabal and Smith were part of a band called Graduate, who produced an album, Acting My Age, in 1980. The band was Beatlesque since they were emerging from a post-Beatles culture, and they were inspired by other bands such as Talking Heads. The band broke up before completing their next album, Ambitions. From there, Orzabal and Smith went on to form a band they initially dubbed History of Headaches, though they changed the name and became the influential, successful, new wave synth pop band Tears for Fears. In 1982, Orzabal married Carolyn Johnston. The first success of Tears for Fears came with their third single, Mad World. It charted as number three in the UK. In 1983, they released their first album, The Hurting. Orzabal felt that their debut album didn't represent what he or the other band members were like as people. Their next album, Songs from the Big Chair, remained high on UK charts for a year. Was there a calculated attempt to change your albums from The Hurting to Songs from the Big Chair because some people thought that these songs on The Hurting were too serious? I don't, I think everything I said is important and I'm, I'm meeting people around, well, around America. That The Hurting means a lot to a lot of people. I'm quite surprised a lot of people think The Hurting's great and think the Songs from the Big Chair isn't as good. On tour, after playing for over three months, Tears for Fears were performing a gig in Kansas. With their recent album charting at number one, they were at the top of the pop world. After the gig, they went to a bar, where they had to pay $1.50 to get in, because a woman called Alita Adams was playing. Adams's emotional, artistic singing inspired Orzabal and Smith. She was singing, she was crying when she was singing, and we were sat at the bar crying. In 1987, they invited her to be a singer and pianist on their next album, The Seeds of Love. The album took three years and over one million pounds to produce, partly because Smith was going through a divorce with his first wife and Orzabal was becoming a perfectionist. Tension within the band led to Smith leaving Tears for Fears in 1991. The split was thought to be caused due to Smith wanting to slow down the pace of their work, while Orzabal had developed a particularly precise approach to production. In the 90s, Orzabal produced two albums under the name Tears for Fears without Kurt Smith. Elemental achieved gold status in the US, while Raul and the Kings of Spain was a more experimental record. 
Here is some footage from the music video for Low Life, a single on Audible's one and only solo album under his name. The album, Tomcat Screaming Outside, never made the charts, and had the unfortunate release date of September 11, 2001 in the US. By this point you're probably wondering what's going on in this music video, and I've done some research and I don't know either. We're doing this uh, the video for the first single called Low Life, and um, the director's a guy called Joe Tanner, and he came up with this really bizarre treatment, which to this day I still I just read the script again, and I still don't understand it. But it's the kind of talks about the life of a pair of dog slippers. These dog slippers are on the feet of a a, a naked man. After nine years without a single word spoken to each other, Orzabal and Smith shared a phone call. The pair must have realised how much they missed each other, since Orzabal moved his family to be closer to Smith again. They worked on a record, Everybody Loves a Happy Ending, released in 2004. In 2014, Orzabal published a novel about a middle-aged, semi-retired pop star, and the story was derived from some of his own experience. His wife, Carolyn, died of natural causes in 2017, which affected Orzabal deeply, and he withdrew from concerts scheduled in 2018 to take a year away from music. This year, he remarried writer and photographer Emily Rath. Currently scheduled for a February release in 2022, Roland Orzabal and Kurt Smith have put together the seventh studio album of Tears for Fears, called The Tipping Point. Roland Orzabal was part of an era-defining movement in music, a central figure in the age of synth-pop. The first song I ever heard from Tears for Fears was Everybody Wants to Rule the World. It was unlike any style I'd heard before, and when I was younger I thought it was the best song ever written. Songs such as Head Over Heels and Shout solidified my love for the band. Through their music, Orzabal and Smith comment on human nature and society, and they capture the timeless themes of love, protest, power, and politics. They started as youths concerned with the world, and became older people still concerned about the world. This project has taken me over a month, and I'm not sure how to conclude it. Goodbye, I guess?